Welcome to this week's America with an Accent. This episode is the second part of our discussion on intermarriages between foreign and American-born partners with focus on children of this type of marriage. How do children benefit from exposure to at least two different cultures? What is third culture kid theory? Is the fear of losing the white American identity real? Dr. Cristian Doña Reveco, a sociology associate professor with the University of Nebraska at Omaha, Hillary and Besmir Joka, a young couple of Omaha as well, and Jamie Schilling, an almost 23-year-old who lived in three different countries and now of Chicago, provide the answers. Children of third culture. So who noticed each other first? Was it you that noticed him or he that noticed I you? I think or? it was me. Yes. It was, I knew right. the first day I met her that <laughs> that's the person I'm going to marry. So yeah. it didn't take us long to come to the conclusion that, yeah. I mean, it took me a little bit less than it was a little bit convincing to be done. <laughs> yeah, but it was I was happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because it was, we met in January, almost, yeah, three years ago this yes. month. And, and it was shortly after that he met my family. And, um, like three, about three yeah, months. and then in the summer, I had taken him, you know, to my hometown and where he got to, you know, kind of have, uh, like, closer time with my, my parents. And, yeah. Now you have a son. Yes, he is almost uh, seven months year old. Seven yeah, he's months? seven months. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. His name is Desian, mm -hmm. which is a typical Albanian name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whose choice was that, and why? Well, I think it was mostly your choice. Yeah, <laughs> I just I we wanted to have an Albanian first name, and. Um, Bess's father's name is Bessem, and his name is Bessemir. And so I wanted to like stick with that Bess as part of uh, Bessian's name. So, um, and it has a really beautiful meaning also. That wasn't the reason that we chose his name. We wanted to have something that was the best root, but. Um, and can you share the meaning with us? Yeah, it's a, a man of faith. Yes. Yeah, man of faith. So. Yeah, I didn't is, know that. Yeah, I figured you did, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and he has no, a right. middle name that is Raymond, which is it comes from my family. My one of my grandfather's names was Raymond. So because in Albanian culture they don't, oh, don't give, no, we yeah. don't have middle no. names. So uh, I wanted to have something that also reflected my side. But, yeah. yeah, and I've heard that case, and I think it's yeah. an excellent choice yeah. that the middle name, the first name would yeah. be from father's side, and the yeah. middle name from mom's yeah. side. Yeah. So I think it's a great choice. Yeah, and if we're a able to have more children, we'll we will also do a first name that is Albanian. It's That's yeah, we want to carry that tradition yeah. or that culture on, you know, in it's their a, name. It's a unique name. Yeah, it is. yeah. People yeah, and you know, thinking about you know Bessian <clears throat> sharing the Albanian culture, you know, it's maybe he won't know much Albanian language, or the you know family culture that we have won't be specifically Albanian. It'll be kind of like a blend, you know. At least yeah. he'll know his himself name. as Albanian, just given his first name. Yeah. Who gets to pick the ethnicity of the kid? By law, what is the kid considered to be? And then how do parents perceive okay. the identity issue? So that's an interesting question because there are two sides, okay? One is, as you're saying, who decides to uh, you know, ethnicity? That is something that parents to based on who you know fills a form, right? Um, the U.S. Census, for example, if the father was you know filling the form and the father was white, he might be more inclined to say that his children were white. Uh, if the if the wife was filling the form and the wife was let's say Filipino, uh, she might be more inclined to say, well, they are. Um, Asian. So it, it, it depends on who is filling the form, right? And when you go to the doctor, sometimes they, they ask you to fill, you know, the, the ethnicity or the race. That also depends on who, you know, how the person who is signing, who is filling the form, thinks of what their children are. Okay? So that is, uh, that is one thing. Uh, now, the children, when they grow up, they are the ones who can decide, right? They are the ones who say, I am this. And that depends of how 
in which culture they felt more comfortable at the end. Or if they, they might say, you know, I'm mixed race, right? Um, we were actually, my wife is Colombian and I'm Chilean. While we are both Latinos, we come from different cultures, right? Because there are some differences between, or there's several differences between Chileans and Colombians. So my daughters, mainly, who are older, um, 13 and 11, were asking, or we're talking about, you know, which one is the best country, the best culture. And we, you know, we say, well, but you are half and half. And, and one of my daughters said, but you also say that we are part American, part thing. I said, well, yeah, the thing is, you know, genetically, you are half, half of your DNA is Chilean, half of your DNA is Colombian. But here you are being raised outside of your household in a U.S. environment, in a fairly privileged U.S. environment, right? So that is something else. But at home, we only speak Spanish. We eat food from our countries. Uh, at the same time, they would eat hamburgers or whatever else, and turkey and, um, for uh, New Year's or for Thanksgiving. Yeah. So they have this mix, right? And I remember years ago, one of my daughters um, was talking to a girl she met in gym class. She was probably six or seven. And she was talking to, I was looking at her, and she was, okay, my name is Camila, and I am, and I am, and she runs back to me and says, Dad, what am I? Uh, uh, I said, well, you are a third Chilean, a third Colombian, and a third American, American. right? I said, okay, and she went back and, and, and told her. So th that it depends on how you raise the children within that marriage. Yeah. Our case, we particularly decided to raise them in this third culture, yes. right? That includes all of them, but that might not be the case. Um, I've heard of cases where um, Latino families um, completely forget it or, or attempt to forget about their culture of origin in order for the children to have more possibilities in the country. So there's no Spanish at home. Uh, they prevent from you know, uh, listening to music in, in Spanish or anything that uh, will, um, that will um, locate the children within a particular ethnic group. So he'll pass as white, or he'll pass as something else, right? That is, it's, it's privilege at the end, right? We can do it, my family, my wife and I, we can do it because I live in a highly educated area, because I'm a professor at a university, and that works. But I know that someone who is, whose parents never went to college, who came here and documented, and then they uh, managed. managed to stay and, and change their papers, and. Uh, the children is first generation in college, they might feel that, that is, they need something else. Um, I would like to go back to Besian. I think it's a great uh, choice because he will have the, he will always be reminded of his roots. Yeah. But mm. what is your decision? What, uh, how do you want your son to be identified with in terms of ethnicity? Albanian, American, Albanian American, or? Mm -hmm. Just, I, I would say Albanian American, Albanian. it would be, I want him to get the best of uh, the best of both cultures, yeah. and as you know, if he if he turns out to be a soccer player, obviously <laughs> he's gonna play for the Albanian team. <laughs> yes. Do you agree he has, to made, that? <laughs> he has made the decision now. <laughs> really? Uh, I mean, that's <laughs> well when it comes to soccer, yes, yeah. If he decides that, we It'll will be up that. to him, but I'll <laughs> support him if he yes. chooses yes. the right thing. <laughs> Just the right thing. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, we want we would want him to get the best of both cultures, so yeah. I mean in America, yeah. I don't know and what you... Yeah, even for him to be able to like really appreciate like what your your mom and dad, you know, offer, like what your family gives to him, you know, for him to like find a lot of value in the Albanian culture just from like, yeah, the songs that your mm. mom sings and yeah. 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 Now, the other side, there's a beautiful theory out there um, has been going on for about 50 years that's called the third culture kids. And the third culture kids theory was designed mostly to explain how children of, um, initial children of diplomats, you know, yes. because they were born 
they lived in different cultures. Yeah. They, the parents were, you know, maybe U.S. born, but they were growing up in France, then in China, then in Bolivia, whatever. Yeah. So third culture kids theory basically states that these kids live in, not in their parents' culture, not in their country where they're living culture, but in a third place where they integrate both, right? where they, you know, they're bilingual or trilingual many times, where they, they take what they want, what, they, what makes them feel better from each of the cultures, and they um, confront life from that perspective. They're also more open to change. They are uh, less, um, they have less racist attitudes, uh, less conservative attitudes. So that is, you know, there is a, a literature on on third culture kids that proves that it's, it's a really good thing for kids. Jamie Schilling is almost 23 years old and he grew up in four countries, United States, Austria, Norway, and Poland. His father was a diplomat and as Jamie puts it, he was lucky enough to be taken along for the ride. Jamie joins us from Chicago, Illinois, USA. Jamie, given your background, I felt like I needed to add Illinois and USA, although Chicago is a very well-known city. <laughs> I would like to start with uh, where were you born and when did you move abroad? Yes, yeah, so I was born in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, um, a few years ago, like I said, about, about to be 23. Um, but uh, we'd move every three years or so. So my dad was in, uh, in the States for a year for language training. So then we'd move about every three years, come back to Virginia for language training, uh, spend another three years at a post, um, and then come back. So from around first grade through third grade, I was in Oslo, Norway. From fifth grade through seventh grade, I was in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, even before that, when I was in pre-K about, I was, uh, I was in Austria. So it's, it's been a journey. It's, it's been a fun one, though. Yes, how many, how many years all together did you spend abroad? I think it'd be about nine, so about nine. I, I, the fun fact I used to say was uh, I spent half my life overseas, but not, as I keep getting older, the number keeps dwindling, so at some point it's going to be, yeah, I spent a quarter of my life overseas. It's a little less impressive, but still nine years. So. How many languages do you speak? So I speak Polish? Oh, I, I can order a hamburger in Polish, so my family, uh, we say that counts. Um, but we speak uh, German, Norwegian, French, and then, uh, of course, English. And that's because you lived in Europe? Yes, correct. When did you move back to the United States, your family, and you moved back to the United States? Correct, yeah, we moved back in uh, the fall of 2009. And where is your family now? So right now they're in Omaha, Nebraska. So, Do you remember anything that you were happy to move back to the United States? And I'm telling you this because I remember, I recall a family that they were finishing their PhDs in Germany and every time the family landed back in the United States, they would go to a taco place. They missed tacos. <laughs> How about you? Do you remember, remember anything like that? Uh, so several things. I'll start with one. My mom wouldn't let, let me live this down if I ever forgot this. My mom swears that uh, the thing we were most impressed by when we came back to the U.S. was that there were unlimited refills um, for soda. Um, I'd say as far as personally, um, there were no... Um, some of the, I'm a big sports fan. I, I missed uh, being able to watch, you know, whatever it was, uh, college football and not have it not be three in the morning. But also being able to speak English as well and understand what's happening around me is also really nice. Um, and I always remember because we so we'd come in uh, most recently from Poland and we'd always connect through Chicago O'Hare. And I always remember like the most happy I'd be is when we were on that little hour flight from Chicago to Omaha. And I was just like, like we're back and I can't wait for it. So um, okay. I'd say just everything in general. I'd also like to mention my grandparents as well. So. Okay, so let me summarize it. Your parents live here in Omaha, Nebraska. You went, you graduated from high school here in Omaha, Nebraska. Graduated from college, Marquette University, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Live and work in Chicago. I know, Jamie, you say that home is not a place on the map or a building, but honestly, where do you consider yourself to be from here in the United States? Right now, I'd say, I'd still say Omaha, as uh, kind of plain as that sounds. Um, I've always kind of had the belief where, um, 
you know, I'd say also my family where, you know, you know, home is where my family is right now. It's home is where the dog is. And right now that's Omaha. So I'd still say it's Omaha's home, but you know, I'd, I'd say a little bit of me stays in each place. Like I'd, I'd also consider Milwaukee home to a lesser extent. And obviously now I'm living in Chicago. So that's also home as well. But I'd say if you were just to straight up ask me, Jamie, where's home? Definitely Omaha. Cause that's where the parents are. In the cases where, you know, third culture kids or children are raised, knowing that they have a cultural background. My argument is that um, they learn more. There's, there are studies that show that children who learn two languages at early age, while it might take them longer to learn to read, they do uh, do better in schools than other children, right? Um, because there's, you know, they are open to the brains develop in a different way. Yeah. Right. When, you know, when you learn a language, it's like learning to play an instrument. And how about the society? What is the benefit of the society? It, to a person that is resisting the idea of this intermarriage, what do we say to convince that, listen, yes, we understand the differences, but look at the benefits of this marriage. So one of the main um, points of resistance in this kind of um, debates of intermarriages is that the either the race or the culture, depending on how we frame it, it becomes watered down. These people are coming to uh, not even not, not to steal our jobs, but simply to steal our identity, right? What happens in England? What what's happening in France? Um, what we're seeing there is this reaction to the fear of losing one's identity. Is that a real fear? Is it a based fear? Yes and no. Uh, yes, the identity of the group will change. No, because it has to change. It has, it's, always, it's not a static phenomenon. Identity is not a static phenomenon. I cannot say that my identity as Chilean, for example, is the same as my great-grandfather's. Right? There's, there's no way. Not only because I live abroad or because I speak two languages, simply because there are 100 years differences between when my grandfather was my age, or you know, 80 years differences between when my grandfather was my age and now that I am this age. Right? So the entire world has changed, the country has changed, everything has changed. The identity is not static, but it's dynamic and it changes through time. When we understand that, then we can see, we can say, there's, what's the fear about? If it's going to change, it always changes. Now, what, when, we, when we convince people that that is something hap that is happening, the possibilities are endless. Again, people that speak two more languages develop, are better at doing all the things that people that only learn one language. Um, you mean in life or academically? In life. In life, they're more attuned to racial differences. They understand better when there are racial differences and what are the problem with those racial differences, right? Racial and ethnic differences. So they are less racially biased. Um, people that you know are third culture kids, people that are uh, brought up in, in two cultures at least, um, are less prone to participate in wars. Right, because there's this idea that there's there, exactly there's 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 a more what has been called in in European literature a cosmopolitan uh, worldview, right? And that it's at the end it's better. Do you think of yourself as an American in terms of ethnicity? I think so. Um, I think when I was younger, there was more of a distinction because. I just come from overseas and there were at times me questioning myself like, well, I have lived most of my life overseas. Am I really? But I think, you know, after spending more time in the U.S., I'd say definitely proud American. And um, you're saying that your connection, you, you, you still have some feelings for your countries where you, for the countries where you grew up. When it comes to, when it comes to loyalties and a sense of belonging, do you think that you belong to those countries as well, the countries where you grew up? Definitely. Um, 
kind of running joke in the family that we have is especially when the Olympics and the World Cup come on, it's the most challenging part for me because, uh, you know, like, especially in the Olympics, like I hope the Norwegians do well, but I also hope the Germans do well. Um, but I also hope the Polish teams do well. And so it's just a- almost a conflict of interest, but I hope they all do really well. So it's, I, I'd say definitely I'm rooting for all of them. And like, I'd see a certain part of me in them, but more so now it's just a, gosh, I hope they do well. And you know, like, like I said, I feel a little bit of me has stayed there, but it's not, not as big as it once was. Knowing foreign languages, has it helped you professionally? I'd say it'd be, it, it's helped me more in mannerisms and how to behave uh, more than languages. Um, I'd say especially having to move around so often and adjust so much it really helps you. It really forces you to be more personal with people, and that's really helped me in the workplace, whether it's getting something from this coworker here or just, you know, small talk with another coworker there. I mean, it helps me feel more comfortable, I'd say. Um, the language part's definitely coming at points, uh, whether it be bringing up German and Norwegian, but I'd say definitely the mannerisms of how to behave in the workforce has helped a lot, especially being the son of a diplomat where that's literally my dad's livelihood for for a certain number of years. And that's all I really knew was, okay, like if my dad's doing it, that's probably the way I should act. And that, I'd say even to this day that helps me, whether it's interacting with someone who's my age as a colleague or someone who's a senior exec, it's just a respect thing that's helped, uh, you know, it's, I get that from overseas, I'd say. And uh, Jamie, yes, you were young when you moved back, but has that, how has that experience influenced your perspective on life and world? Well, I'd say it's definitely given me a very unique perspective that not a lot of kids get. Um, moving around every three years is pretty difficult, but I'd say it's definitely given me some some, some very good benefits. Um, it's definitely given me a, a better appreciation for the United States. Um, I'd say definitely a better appreciation for my family, realizing, you know, who the more important people are in your life, whether there's, um, because there are, there'll always be those people that are in with your life for the long run, your family, your brother, certain friends. And unfortunately, um, they're going to be those people who are only in your life for a certain amount of time. Um, and, you know, growing up overseas as a third culture kid, moving every three years, that's one of the biggest takeaways I had was, okay, um, some of these people in just a few years, they're going to completely forget about you. And that's fine. You know, there's, it's not nothing personal. They're not doing it purposely. It's just, that's just life. And you need to move on with that and kind of, kind of accepting that I'd say is freeing in itself where it gives you, you know, it opens your heart up for more experiences And, you know, even more people to meet. Um, I think that's definitely another big takeaway I've taken from growing up overseas is that there are so many different people, um, whether it's here in the U.S. or even abroad, where it is so many different people. Everyone has a story. I think that I've really gained a greater appreciation for that, where, you know, you need to, you need to think globally, not just me, me here and like the Midwest and In Chicago, you know, like there's a bigger world out there. Everyone's got a nice story to tell. I think it's appreciating those differences, and that's how you really build a relationship. And that's, again, big takeaway from overseas. Thank you, Jamie, for being with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And um, you said that you traveled to Albania, mm -hmm. and so and you are exposed to the sound of the albanian language yes now it is it comes a test how albanian are you yeah, <laughs> not, at all. not at all how many words do you know yeah no. i don't know not maybe a handful she learned of there is one word Ulu, Ulu. Ulu, <laughs> which means yeah, sit every sit. time we went like yeah. visiting people there's like first thing they say is just like Ulu. Ulu. Yeah. <laughs> so even if she yeah. tried to get up to do something so she learned that very quick yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i tried to like know like yeah phyla madera just because it's like well not Thank something you. i can say yes. that shows yes. some gratitude for yeah. all that they're giving but yeah i don't know and and when we first started spending time together i did I did really press best to like teach me, teach me some of the words, teach me some of the language, and he didn't, which is fine. But it, you know, at first it was more, it was challenging just because we, you know, when I'm with this, when I was with his family, it would be they would be speaking Albanian, and I just felt like I was missing out on so much because Bess would, you know, stop and say what they're talking about, but it's like, well, 
I can't be a part of this conversation. I can't also, because you're done talking about it now. <laughs> I'm just hearing it. And it's gotten a lot better. I mean, I just kind of appreciate listening to them, you know, share mm -hmm. stories if they're speaking in Albanian or they, a lot of, I mean, they don't really, they speak English when I'm around, yeah. which is really, I know that it comes more naturally for them to speak Albanian, Albanian to each yeah. other. So I feel really thankful when they do speak English when I'm there, knowing that I'm the only one that's, <laughs> you yeah, know, they're only they're doing, doing it for me. For yeah, which is very thoughtful. Yeah, but. yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, how about, we talk a little bit about superstition. Yeah. <laughs> superstition. It's a lot of superstition. Yeah. You know, when I moved to the United States and yeah. I was told that you cannot really walk under a ladder because yeah. it brings bad luck, yeah. I was like, how can that be bad luck? Yes. Do you know any Albanian superstition? Yeah, we, we were, yes. Um, one thing that, we were just talking about this. It, uh, at New Year's, I had, I, Bess's mom was saying, she was telling a story. I can't even remember what she was saying. And I, I just sneezed in the middle of what she was saying. And she's like, oh, it's true. And, and I, was, I didn't even think anything it's of it. It's more of a confirmation. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> she's like, well, if someone sneezes when, I'm, when you're saying something, then it means that whatever you're saying is, in fact, the truth. I'm like, oh. I'm totally going to use that. That's great, you know. But there's, I, I know that there's been so many things that, even just like um, medicine and how you, you know, heal ailments is not, you know, that's not, you know, not what I grew up doing. Right. So it's a little bit different than, not that they're superstitions, it's just like a different handling. Yeah, different. Some yeah. of them are superstitions. Yeah, <laughs> some yeah, maybe that's true. Well, do you know that you cannot take trash out after sunset? No. This <laughs> the prosperity <laughs> will leave wrong. the house. <laughs> so you cannot cut your nails after sunset either. <laughs> no, no you know don't that. know that. The one I remembered when I was growing up is like, if you whistle when it's dark, you bring in the bad spirits. <laughs> really? <laughs> See? That's yeah. new to me too. But I mean, I'm, there are so many. I'm sure yeah. they were trying to stop us from whistling. Yeah, they just, like, yeah. Yeah, there's some it. logic <laughs> behind it, you know, they just want you to stop. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. You can watch all three full interviews on our website at www.newamericansmedia.com slash America with an accent. I hope to see you again next week here on KPAO or online at newamericansmedia.com, our NAM Facebook page and our NAM YouTube channel. I am Enkela Vebio. <laughs>